being a leader, you know, and that's different. I, I like the way you say that. It's different than um, just leading in your classroom. Yeah. You know, being a leader at the school level is it, it's a different skill. It's a different skill set for sure. Yeah. Uh, for those of you, it looks like there's a few people that have come in. Yep. I'm not sure whether the <clears throat> keynote is running long, but you are uh, in a session. We're going to be talking about the Lift Framework and Instructional Partnership and a new resource that's available to Washington educators. Uh, so as you're coming in uh, or if you're viewing this, um, you know, at a later time. All of the resources are available on, on the link uh, that you'll see on the screen. It's bit.ly, capital L, capital I, capital F, capital T, capital R, as in resources. So Lyft resources, and that will take you to the slide deck, uh, how you can find more information about the Lyft framework um, and all kinds of other good stuff. So feel free to go ahead and navigate to that. Uh, and as you're coming in, uh, just do that. And uh, we'll get started. We're gonna wait. Uh, the best practice has been to wait about five minutes so people can navigate uh, to the right location. And so we'll just wait until people come in uh, and then we'll get started probably about five minutes after the hour. And it looks Thanks like we're starting to get more people in. So yep. yeah, yep. it must've just ended too. over there. Yep. So Mark, will you do me a favor and put the, um, that link in the chat? Yep, of course. Um, yeah, so I will. I, I, I did that in the past, but I will do that as well. I'm going to turn on CC right now while I'm thinking of it. Perfect. And I'm going to jump to the background. Sounds good. Thanks so much for your help. Yeah. So welcome. As people are coming in, um, I'm going to drop it into the chat here in just a second. Uh, we will be talking about the Lyft Framework, Instructional Partnership, and a really great opportunity and resource uh, that's available to educators uh, starting this, this fall, actually. Uh, so just uh, you're in the right place if you're interested in learning about instructional partnership. Uh, the link that's on the slide, uh, bit.ly Lyft Resources, will take you to the slide deck. Uh, a lot of resources that I'm going to be highlighting over the course of the next hour. Uh, just a kind of a one-stop shop. And I'm going to drop those into chat here in just a second as well. So hold on a second while I do that. There we go. Did I do that right? No, I didn't do that right. Sorry. There. What is... Oh, you know, I bet you I have. I'm um, so my apologies for uh, miss miss um, mistypes in my chat. I'm uh, learning Finnish, and uh, yes, I am. I'm learning Finnish, and I, I changed my keyboard to Finnish. And apparently, one of those symbols is different for the U.S. keyboard. So let's try that one more time. Bit Lee slash Lift Resources. And for those Finnish speakers out there uh, today, huva uh, huomenta. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Ray. We'll be getting started here in just a few minutes. Uh, we're going to wait for people to transition over from the other session that just ended a few moments ago. So if you are coming in, uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, navigate to the link uh, that's uh, both in the chat as well as on the screen that has information about the Lyft framework, some of the resources, and the slide deck if you want to follow along. And uh, as people are coming in, why don't we go ahead and check to see who who you are, or no, who you are. Uh, what do you do and where do you do it? If you could just drop that into chat, that will get us started and uh, I'd be kind of curious to see who's coming from where and what you're doing. Frank is coming to us from Marysville. Welcome, Frank. <clears throat> Michael, are you coming from Denver as in Colorado or a, a city in, in, in Washington that I'm not aware of? Like Stevens. Oh, wow. Michael, welcome. <clears throat> 
I have, uh, I have a colleague that used to work in Colorado, a really great library leader that used to work out there. Great, Burian, Jesse, welcome. Looks like we have some people that might be in coaching roles uh, or kind of quasi coaching roles, that's interesting. Susan, great from Yakima. All right. Well, it looks to me like we're gonna get probably, we might get a few stragglers that come in um, a little bit later, but I'm gonna go ahead and get started to make sure we have enough time to cover what we're gonna be doing today. Um, so let me navigate to the slide deck and we'll move along. So uh, my name is Mark Wright uh, and I am a free range educator. Um, I have had a, a wonderful career in education. I was a teacher librarian for 20 years at elementary, middle and high school. Um, and then I was uh, recognized as the 2012 Washington State Teacher of the Year, uh, which is a really just a wonderful honor. Um, it was a truly I'm not worthy moment, um, but really just a great opportunity for me to learn more about education and connect to colleagues and, and leaders, uh, not only around the state, but also around the United States. So a transformative event, certainly in my life. Um, so I've also been a digital learning coach and for seven years I was a uh, district administrator. So I worked as a manager and director of instructional technology. Uh, for two years I served as the chief digital officer, so overseeing all IT operations in a school of about 22,000 students. Um, and, uh, and more recently I've been doing a lot of consulting work, uh, including creating this lift framework that I'll be sharing with you today. Um, I also do some work at the national level, working with Future Ready Schools. Um, I started the Future Ready Librarians Initiative. Um, and lest you be afraid that I'm gonna be talking about librarians all today, I'm not. I love librarians, I am a librarian, but this is really about educators writ large, and we're gonna be talking about uh, some opportunities to um, kind of empower educators as instructional coaches and partners. So. With that, I'm um, gonna put a little chat in here, get ourselves warmed up for our first session of the day. So uh, you can either think of this as uh, a frown or turning the frown upside down. So you can either be dreaming about this or if this is something that keeps you up at night. So think about your experience in your school, whether it's in a classroom, whether you're working with colleagues, whether you oversee a building or, or work at a district level. So which of these things, and I'm realizing all of these bullet points are ones that, you know, there, there are issues that we need to deal with, but you know, what are the one top one or two of those that, that, that just jump out as things that really are front of mind as you're thinking about going into this coming school year? Um, and if you're coming in late, there's a link at the very bottom there uh, to get you to the resources uh, for the presentation. It'll have the slide deck and all that sort of stuff. So uh, let's go ahead and post into chat Kind of what keeps you up at night or what do you dream about as you kind of move and think about the coming school year? And there's no wrong answers, by the way. And if there's something I didn't include on there, feel free to do it. There's, there's a spot for other as well. So I'm seeing uh, equity, uh, CRT and burnout, Innovative instruction, student choice, scheduling of specialist time. Yeah, yeah, the nuts and bolts sorts of stuff. Um, that, that's a tough one, Beth. Equity and burnout. Great. Yeah, equity and anti-racism. Yeah. Yeah, so that, Amy, you're kind of speaking to this challenge of engagement and um, and just, you know, again, uh, we kind of broke some things during the pandemic in terms of with remote and hybrid learning. And so just how to how how to reimagine that as we as we move forward. So thank you. I appreciate your kind of your thinking on that. Um, so. I want to kind of um, because I'm presenting today, um, I want to kind of uh, start off for us thinking a little bit about instructional partnership. Um, as a teacher librarian, um, that was really kind of one of my, my primary roles over the first 20 years of my instruction. Uh, certainly I did instruction in the library and, and in other contexts, uh, but I also was a collaborator with, with other educators. So it's something that's just natural to me. Um, I transitioned into a role um, working as an instructional, uh, digital instructional coach. 
Um, and that was really, in many ways, very similar to what I did as a teacher librarian, but not necessarily in the context of the library. And then for the seven years that I was an administrator, I worked very closely uh, with librarians and coaches and oversaw teams, really using coaching and professional development as a, as a tool for um, not only improving educator practice, but also trying to improve student outcomes. So I'm a real believer in this idea of instructional partnership. So I want you to think a little bit about um, kind of who are your partners, who are the people that you kind of lean on and think about um, in your in your own school setting? And I think, yes, okay. Um, so there's kind of two schools of, of thought of this. There's, there, there's kind of the ad hoc and informal uh, partners that we have. So you can see it on the left-hand side, shoulder to cry on. It could be a Twitter buddy. It could be someone in your PLC or your PLN. Um, it could be a vendor or rep. Uh, I had some really great relationships with the people that sold me uh, books uh, because they knew things that I didn't know happening in other schools or in other districts around uh, the Pacific Northwest. But then there are also these formal roles. So teacher, librarian, counselor, mentor, instructional coach, technology coach, uh, and also building and district leaders that play a, a more um, formal role, I guess is probably the best way to put it, around supporting educators and providing um, training and, and, and insight into how to innovate practice. So there's a lot of research, <clears throat> and this is something, this is a great, uh, my, my wife is a, an ELL coach, and she turned me on to this, this, um, this really powerful data point. Um, Joyce and Showers back in 2002, actually this is when they published their information, but they had done the research in the, some previous years, really powerful uh, evidence that coaching has significant impacts on improving educator practice. So it's not just, and this is, this is not really something that's, a, that's rocket science. We know this as educators, but we frequently overlook how important coaching and instructional partnership is. So you can see when it comes to knowledge of skill, demonstrating the skill and using the skill in the classroom, when you combine what I'm doing right now, which is sharing some ideas, and then combining it with instructional partnership and coaching, that has significant, significant impacts on how well those new skills are implemented into practice. So, so long history of research that shows that this idea of instructional partnership is important. More recently, um, Digital Promise, which is a, a wonderful nonprofit that does a lot of research work, they do a lot of really innovative pro uh, projects, um, really um, looked at some specific, um, they, they, they've got a kind of a cohort of schools that they've been looking at in detail. Um, and they've basically just plus one what Joyce and Showers identified, the coaching transforms teacher learning, that it's transformative for that. So that was really riffing on what Joyce and, and Showers uh, were talking about. But more importantly, that it improves teacher practice and student achievement, that it improves teacher retention and it also improves school culture. So it not only deals with kind of the operational challenges of school, but also the cultural challenges of school. And then in the middle, they highlight the fact that coaching improves teachers and students' powerful use of technology. So coaching is really a no-brainer. It's a, it's, 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 it, it works. Um, and I'm just gonna remind you that if you have the slide deck, all of the research and all of this information, you can simply pull up the slide deck, click on the graphic or the link, and it'll take you to this information. So if you're interested in finding more about this, you can get to it yourself. So question, why aren't schools embracing coaching and collaboration? Well, there are really two big issues, and I can speak to this both as a classroom school practitioner as an educator as well as a district leader so i'll just be real honest there are systemic issues associated with coaching cost is one of them so anytime you identify a person that is in a coaching or a teacher on special assignment role you're taking that person out of a classroom and there are costs associated with that both physical costs and also costs to instruction time staffing caseload Many districts are just lazy about coaching, um, truth be told, is that they don't feel like that's really important. One of the main reasons that that's the case is that they don't see a clear return on investment. So they invest in these coaches or these mentors or programs that support coaching, but they lose sustained interest and support because they don't see it necessarily translating to something that they can measure. 
Um, and that's a real, a real issue. For example, in my school district, we had a huge investment in instructional technology coaches, but then over, I mean, it was great for four or five years. And then suddenly they were, they were challenged with, with, with budget cuts. Um, and it's really about this, this return on investment. They weren't thinking that say, oh, hey, great. We've got the devices in the hands of students. We don't need technology coaches anymore. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. But on the educator side, there's also issues with this, and that is time. The educators are busy. They've got lots of stuff on their plate. They've got instructional responsibilities. So this whole issue of, um, of time and balance in terms of, um, you know, uh, either investing time in coaching or being a coach is a real challenge. These other ones, I think, are probably going to be familiar to you. This is one of the things I learned as a teacher of the year is um, this I'm not worthy sort of um, scenario is it's really hard for other educators to get in front of a, a, for an educator to get in front of other educators and say, I know something more than you do, or how about you do this or try this? And I worked personally, I, I felt that, but in working with uh, the coaches in my district, that was something that was a real aha for me is that I recognized that, that they were great teachers in the classroom, huge amount of confidence, but as soon as we asked them to teach a PD class or whatever, there was a significant kind of culture shock associated with getting in front of other educators. So it's really about confidence and fluency and just, just being able to kind of get out there. So second chat. So I want you to now think about in your own situation in this last school year, um, what did instructional partnership and collaboration look like? Um, so in some cases, you are in a position where you might have been delivering some of that support. And in other cases, you might be the recipient of that support. So whether it's in a school or a district or a system, what did that idea of instructional partnership and collaboration look like last year? And you can put free, free form response here. What, what, what did it look like? And uh, let, I'm gonna take a look in chat and see what people have to say. And you don't have to mention names, unless, of course, it's a great success. Okay, Michael. So Michael had some specific. He was in a. Um, uh, actually in a probably a support role, uh, working with uh, teachers and supporting specifically around some of the Google tools that were new. Uh, staff created the Google Drive to share resources. Okay, so um, kind of some content creation and providing guides and videos and that sort of thing. Um, Saving Grace was weekly planning meeting with fellow music teacher from another building, yeah. And Beth, I'm just kind of curious, would you, if you, if you don't mind responding, um, was that relationship in place before um, the pandemic. So was it a continuation of a relationship or was that something that was new as a result of the pandemic? Was there something that changed there? Yeah, so Amy's kind of reiterating this idea when we're talking about that graphic of kind of the informal versus formal. So it sounds to me in Amy's context, there was definitely that informal ad hoc sort of thing. Okay, so Beth, I really appreciate that response. Um, the, her response was, it was there before the relationship with the other music teacher, but it became more structured and necessary for survival, okay. Yeah, Don, I appreciate that recognition about the kind of some of the differences with, with special education uh, within that community is that there are, um, <clears throat> there are some needs and expertise that is unique to that community, and uh, and it's sometimes hard to translate that for a general audience. Okay, great. So I appreciate your 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 honesty and your your inputs there. So um, here's the here's the challenge, and we're going to get to give you an opportunity to take a look at the lift framework here in just a couple seconds. But I want to kind of frame it around this idea of instructional partnership because I really think that that that's the that's the reason that lift was created. So the two big questions I want you to kind of um, 
uh, use as a, as a jumping off point as you take a look at the Lyft framework is, what if we could expand our thinking about coaching and instructional partnership? How could we, how could we kind of broaden that concept, uh, maybe empower some additional educators as instructional partners? That's the, that's the theory of practice behind this um, Lyft framework. So <clears throat> this is going back to the graphic uh, that I showed you before and we talked about in terms of the informal <clears throat> on the left-hand side and then the formal on the right-hand side. And using my very sophisticated uh, builds here in Google Slides, I'm going to demonstrate here, kind of lift this, this thing that I'm going to show you here in just a couple seconds is really kind of in a sweet spot between informal ad hoc partnership and formal partnership. Uh, and it's really kind of uh, trying to enable more educators to be able to feel like they can engage in partnerships with other, uh, other colleagues, but also providing additional skill set and training so that people have the confidence to do that. All right. So with that, I'm gonna, this, is, uh, this is the link to the Lyft framework. Uh, it's bit.ly and then capital L-I-F-T and lowercase framework. If you have the slide deck up, you can just click on that link and that'll take you right there. I'm gonna give you two little quick prompt slides and then I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes to explore the Lyft framework and I'm gonna bring you back and talk about some specific aspects of it. Here's what you need to know about Lyft as you get started. The whole goal of Lyft is to cultivate instructional partnership broadly. So really redefining what instructional partnership can look like in schools. It is a self-paced professional learning pathway. What that means is it's not a formal course um, but it is an opportunity with activities. Um, all of the all the materials are curated. There are discussion prompts. It's basically ready to go. You can use it right now. Um, it has to be completed with a learning partner. You cannot go through the Lyft framework by yourself. You have to do it with a partner. Um, it models and promotes the idea of learner agency, not only student learner agency, but also uh, adult learner agency. So there's a lot of choice. Um, personalization that's associated with your work in the Lyft framework. And more importantly, it really pulls together a lot of research and practices together so that you can make the connections and try to work on implementing those either in your own instruction or to work with other colleagues to be able to do that. It is also created as open educational resources or OER. So it's available on the OER hub. It's available through this link. What that means is it's free for you to use. There's no charge associated with it. And you can also remix it, reuse it, take parts of it, and make use of it as you see fit. One more prompt, and then I'm going to give you a chance to go ahead and spend some time with it. There are four modules uh, that include uh, resources, discussion, reflection, and application to practice. So it really is uh, designed as a, as a tool to introduce you or reconnect you to big ideas and then give you an opportunity to have some conversation with your learning partner. It's designed to complement existing roles. So this is not a new job, a new role. It is something that you add on to your existing role. So if you are a teacher librarian or an instructional coach or a classroom teacher or a counselor or whatever, it is something that is that is kind of a, a just a, a, a vest you put on, an additional set of skills that you continue doing in your original work, but it gives you kind of an additional skill set to be able to be a more a practiced instructional partner. Gives you some different options for summative assessment or when you're done, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And like I said before, it can be adapted and remixed to meet your local needs. So with that, again, the link is bit.ly lift framework. I'm gonna drop that in the chat just in case people don't have access to that. Uh, and I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes to explore the lift framework. And then I'm going to bring you back and I will have some time for questions and answers. And I have something really exciting to share because this is going to be we're going to have an opportunity in Washington state to have educators um, use the Lyft framework. Um, and I'll just I'll just leave it at that. But it's kind of a cool grand opportunity that's going to be coming up this fall. So with that, I take about 10 minutes. I'm looking at the clock right now and it is 1024. So we'll come back at about uh, 1035 or so. And uh, I've got a couple of prompts here. There we go. Uh, as you're looking at it, if you want to and have time in the chat, what do you like? What makes you wonder? Feel free to put questions as well. Um, I probably won't get to the questions until the very end, but I will answer them if you have them. So with that, I'm going to stop talking, give you a chance to explore the framework. I'll put the link in the chat. And with that, I'm going to mute myself and uh, give you a chance to play around in the framework.
And if people have difficulty getting to it for some reason, go ahead and just drop it in the chat and I'll see if I can troubleshoot it for you.
I'm going to bring you back here in about three minutes or so, and we'll have a chance to look in some more detail. I'm also going to highlight um, some of the specific resources that I, I think would be worth having on your radar, um, whether or not you plan to use the Lyft framework or are interested in that. Um, there's some things I found in, as part of my research that uh, I think would be worth your consideration. Um, so I'll give you about another three, two, three minutes, and we'll bring you back. And um, uh, Susan posted a question in chat. So if you have some questions based on what you've seen or uh, some wonderings, feel free to go and drop those into chat if you're if you're uh, interested. Hey, Mark, you're muted. That was in you. Thank you very much. There we go. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. I should look at chat. Okay, so let's try that again. Sorry, folks. Um, let's go back here. Okay, so module one, let's start again. Uh, module one really is focused on individual um, uh, individual practice, really looking at uh, who you are as a reflective practitioner. Uh, looking at mindsets. So we often think of um, uh, the growth versus fixed mindset in the context of as we work with students, but it really also affects how we work with adults. And so looking at that and examining mental models, uh, also examining communities of practice, uh, learning partnerships, professional learning networks, and how those uh, feed us and support us as, as educators. And then looking kind of at this idea of, of educational leadership as partnership. So it's really about, you know, module one really is about kind of giving us an opportunity to kind of look at our practice in a critical way. This idea of professional uncertainty, we are, we, we've been kind of forced to re-examine who we are as educators as a result of the pandemic. And even as we move into this new year, um, we still have that sense of uncertainty. So it's really about kind of leveraging that moment 
for us to kind of think about our practice in a critical way. So it's really about kind of building confidence as an instructional partner. So that's what module one is all about. Module two focuses on working effectively with, with um, adult learners. So pulls heavily from the work that the Center for Strengthening the Teaching Profession, or CSTEP, has done with their uh, teacher leadership framework. So looking specifically at working with adult learners, uh, communication and collaboration skills, again, specifically with adult learners, and this idea of personalized professional learning. So really looking at the idea of what do we do for professional development? How do we conceive ourselves um, as not only uh, receivers of professional learning, but also uh, people that, that deliver that work? So it's about strengthening interpersonal skills, examining uh, instructional coaching models. We're looking at a lot of a lot of great research around instructional coaching, uh, kind of pulling that stuff forward. And then this idea of personalizing professional learning uh, and, and looking at some specific strategies for doing that. Module three then shifts focus to student learning. And it's built on the idea of learner variability. And I'll share a little bit in just a second, um, some great research and a great resource that was developed by Digital Promise that looks at this idea of learner variability and uses the idea, the very simple idea, that every learner is different. And so you have to design instruction and, and, and instructional activities based on the assumption of that variability. You can't have that one size fits all strategy. So the whole, the whole module really kind of is based on this idea of learner variability. And then looking at ways in which you can kind of lean into that with different types of strategies for innovation, looking at some specific practices, and then this idea of universal design, design for learning, which I think actually has been featured on a couple of the other sessions. Um, so this is where there's an opportunity to kind of connect some pieces. So in our education circles, you know, we're, we're, we love the act, well, I'm sure we love them, but we, we, we use the act and CRT, SEL, and then anti-race inequalities. All those things are, are kind of part of the conversations that we're having both in schools and in districts. How do we fit the pieces together? And really the goal of module three is to try to see the connections between those. And there's a lot of activities and conversations to try to build on that and try to connect that through this idea of universal design for learning. And then digital learning is not going to go away. It's part of our reality. And so really then we've finish with how can we use digital tools to be able to support the innovative teaching and coaching that we're doing. Uh, so we look at some specific frameworks, um, look at what if responsible and effective use is, um, and then look at the idea of partnership. So really about um, kind of grounding and understanding what we do with, with educational technology so that we can provide that support to other colleagues. So the summative options, essentially what you do is you do this with a peer. You have to you have to do the framework with another partner. It's not possible to do it without it. You complete a portfolio for each of the modules, and then that peer um, basically not doesn't evaluate it, but just checks to make sure you've done all the work, and they're part of the conversations as you go through it. So there's no like big end of the uh, project summative um, uh, tool. You just basically go through each of the sessions, and when you're done, then you create a smart goal and you're done with it. As we think forward, so this was just launched uh, in June of this just this this uh, spring. Um, we we are looking at the possibility of integrating it into a Canvas learning management system, so that there's an opportunity to do it as a course. Right now, it just sits as OER, and you can use it as it is, but it's not built into a course. We're also looking at the possibility of creating a micro credential, and a micro credential is essentially an independently assessed um, um, evaluation of artifacts of your work. And so we'll be working on that probably uh, <clears throat> this fall and winter. Uh, the other option too is that you can take this framework in your school uh, or in your district and just adapt it as you see fit because it is open educational resource. And so it's, it's kind of flexible and portable in that respect. So this is the exciting thing I wanted to share with you. And if you looked at the website or looked at the organizer, you'll see that there's some information about this. So really, really excited. This is a project that I, this, this project is something that I've been working on all of last year. And it was really great this, um, this spring is that the PESB, which is the standards board, um, recognized the lift uh, working with CSTEP as uh, for, for a grant for this coming year. And what that's gonna mean is that we'll be able to have a cohort of 20 to 24 educators. Uh, para, paraprofessionals are, are, are also welcome to do it. Also district leaders are welcome to do it. But what that group will do is, is go through the LIFT framework over the course of the school year, have facilitation, they'll be able to get um, 25 uh, credits toward continuing education, 
uh, they'll also be able to get a modest stipend. And so it's just a, a kind of a, you get paid essentially to do the lift framework over the course of the year and get support from me and from others at C-STEP to be able to do that. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, we don't have anything to release because we don't start that process until next week. Uh, but we will be announcing it very soon, and there is a link on the organizer, and I'll have it at the end. If you want more information, would like to kind of be aware when that happens, uh, we can let you know about that. So really exciting about that opportunity. Just a quick thing about PGP. Some people might not know what a PGP is, and essentially it's a way to work with a peer. Uh, you basically create a learning goal for the course of the school year, um, and you have a peer-reviewed process by which you kind of go through that work. Um, the PESB uh, has offered this for multiple years, and a lot of educators are aware of it. But there's also a lot of educators that don't know it's in place. So that's what that is. And if you go to the organizer, I have a link there to tell you more about what the PGP process looks like. So the roadmap is that this was published uh, at the end of June. Um, we're going to be starting the cohort this fall, um, probably starting about September. And then hopefully we'll have a Canvas course soon and maybe the microfinancial coming in the winter. So questions and answers. I'm going to pause for just a second here, um, see if anybody has questions, and then I'm going to I'm going to move on and just give you a few greatest hits as to resources that even if you aren't interested in the Lyft framework, I want to point to some really great stuff that I uncovered in part of my research that I think that might be useful for you regardless of what you're doing. So I'm going to pause for some Q and A if people have those in chat. If not, I will. <clears throat> and we'll move on. And I think what I'll do, just in the interest of time, is I will go ahead and move on, give you some greatest hits here. Um, and if people have questions, go ahead and drop those into chat. So really, the goal behind Lyft is to, as we think about that previous slide, about the challenges that are faced that we're facing, um, Lyft attempts to kind of connect the dots for educators, to be able to see how you can um, kind of minimize or, or mitigate educator burnout, how you can look at innovative instruction and trying to pull some of these, these themes of SEL, learner variability and all in together. I'm not gonna say it's gonna solve the problem because that, that would be like selling snake oil, um, but it does give a path for educators to think through this with another educator and trying to make kind of sense of how all the pieces fit together. So that's really the goal behind Lyft. And then that as well as, as also building the capacity and confidence that you can work with other educators as a partner. So what are some of the greatest hits real quickly it, just like in the event that you aren't interested in Lyft but you uh, want to have some takeaways here? Um, this is something that's just an outstanding resource that uh, most of these are kind of hiding in plain sight and I just want to make sure educators are aware of these. So the C-STEP uh, teacher leadership framework is several years old. We used it exclusively and, and extensively in the LIFT framework because it has some really simple uh, skills and dispositions that educators, and when we talk about teacher leadership, we're talking about any educator providing, uh, you know, playing a role, uh, working with other colleagues in their schools or in their districts. So really, really simple uh, framework. There's some self-assessments, great way to kind of, um, Think about your practice in a critical way, and not say negative critical way, but a critical uh, viewpoint. Digital Promise does some amazing work. Most people have never heard of them. Um, thankfully, uh, Vancouver Public Schools, where I used to work, uh, had some really strong relationships with them. So this is a really good, if you, if you are connected to coaching or interested in coaching, their playbook is really fantastic because it provides some great guides, uh, some justifications, some implementation strategies. For, for effective coaching. So just a really great resource. And again, this is available on the resources page that I shared. Um, Learner Variability Project is a big project that Digital Promise has done. And so they really believe in this idea that every learner is different. And so what you need to do is design instruction for those, you know, each, each, each student. Um, that's a challenge. And so they've developed a, this rich database of research and strategies for all types of learner variability. And I could spend a whole presentation just doing that, uh, but I would encourage you, if this has, sounds mildly intriguing, uh, take a look at the Learner Variability Project and see the resources that they have because they're just outstanding. Um, as an educator, as a district leader, there are some really complicated ideas, um, CRT, SEL, UDL, I love the acronyms. 
uh, understood that org has done an exceptional job of simplifying and kind of getting to the the, the gist and the, the the core ideas around some very complicated educational ideas. So if you're looking for kind of a um, an implementation guide and a really easy way to understand some of these issues that we're, we're working with, particularly around learner variability in our schools, understood.org has some great resources. And I used a lot of those in the Lyft framework. Christensen Institute, this is a little geeky, a little deeper dive, uh, but they do a lot of research around disruptive innovation. And they look specifically, uh, one of their big areas is education. And, and I use uh, quite a bit of their work around uh, innovation in schools. Uh, within the framework, and it's, it's, it'd be worth taking a look at as well. This is another one where it's kind of a cheat sheet guide, like the understood.org. Um, student privacy, intellectual property, those are really complicated topics. Uh, and Connect Safely has done some really nice work around guides for educators about how to understand these topics. So if this seems like something you might be interested in, take a look at that. And then last but not least, if you're looking for images of um, the diverse community of learners and educators that we work in. Um, this is a great Creative Commons licensed uh, school image database um, that all for ed put together, and I use those actually for the framework. So next steps, um, just, just for you, um, we are gonna be offering that PDP grant for educators, we'll be announcing it in August. Um, if you're interested in the LIFT framework, uh, it's there, uh, you can get to it, you already have been able to get to it. So if you have some early adopters uh, as a peer, maybe you have a peer that says, hey, let's try this together, feel free to do that. You might also create a local cohort within your school or district to kind of work on it together. The other thing too is because this is OER, you can basically just take this and use it however you see fit. Uh, you can remix the playlist, maybe there's one module or some aspects or some of the, the sections that are useful and take those and use those. You have, you know, my permission because I've, I've used it from somebody else, you can do that. The other thing too is tear out what you need. Maybe there's just one section that is of use and make, um, you can implement within your own practice, feel free to do that. The other option too is that um, if you're in a district leadership job or school or district leadership uh, position um, and uh, would like to talk about, you know, how we can kind of implement this or adapt this for your own setting, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about that as well. So I want to do a quick little thanks. So this would not be possible without uh, support from CSTEP, the Center for Strengthening and Teaching Professions, specifically Nasue Nishida, who used to be the executive director. She was the one who said, Mark, let's go ahead and do this. And she provided the support for, for it to happen. Lindsay Stevens is the new executive director and is a great partner, and she's kept, kept the ball rolling. So I really appreciate both of them. I have some great educators. You can see their names on there, Brigham Williams, Christy Kalin, um, uh, Karen Wilson, and Brooke Brown, who is the Washington State Teacher of the Year right now has been really some great thought partners as I do this work together. So with that, um, if you're interested in updates or the PGP grant, um, click on the link there, go to that link, and that has a little form, and, and that way you'll be able to stay current on that. Uh, the resources, I've had those up before, but if you um, want to just make sure you bookmark those, and if you want to contact me in general, you can reach me at Gmail. With that, I'm going to stop. I'm giving you a lot of information. That's a lot for 10 o'clock. I appreciate you coming by and stepping uh, stepping into the room. Uh, and if there's any questions, you feel free to drop them into chat. Otherwise, have a wonderful last day of the AESD event uh, and uh, have a wonderful summer. And uh, thank you so much for coming.